Uh, first of all, welcome uh, to Swansea. Welcome to Swansea Physics. So I am the um, co-head of the physics department. My name is Prem Kumar. I'm one of the organizers of this event along with Dr. Sarah Roberts. Uh, the Christmas lectures, well, the teachers know that the Christmas lectures have been a long, long-standing tradition of the uh, physics department at Swansea. In fact, um, our previous head of department, Mike Charlton, it tells me that the history of the physics lectures goes back to the 1970s. And so it's been a really long-standing tradition, one of those things that the last couple of years, they were missed uh, for obvious reasons. And so it's great to restart these lectures again. And it's great to see all school students here, all you know, waiting and inspired, ready to get inspired. And uh, with all the physics that you're going to hear about in these um, couple of hours. And uh, I should mention that these physics lectures have been sponsored this year by the Institute of Physics Wales and the Learned, of so Learned Society of Wales. Uh, the whole idea of these lectures, like I said, is to inspire young people uh, to get interested into physics and into curiosity-driven science. And, um, you know, almost, it's, it's arguably one of the subjects that actually is most curiosity driven and really gets into the nuts and bolts of questions about the universe is particle physics. It's one of those top of subjects that really grapples with fundamental science at the most nuts and bolts kind of level. And uh, today we have Dr. Sam Gregson, who is um, a particle physicist. He got his PhD at Cambridge and was part of the uh, LHCB collaboration. And if that doesn't mean much to you, LHC stands for the Large Hadron Collider. How many people have heard of the Large Hadron Collider? Pretty much everyone. Does anyone know what B stands for in LHCB? OK, fine. Maybe Sam will tell you about that as we go on. But uh, Sam's, Sam's been involved with Swansea Physics for a few years. He's been presenting some really uh, stupendous lectures and they leave you awestruck. And so at the end of the lectures, you should make sure that you ask tons of questions. Obviously, you'll be involved in the lectures heavily, as you can already see. It's going to be very interactive. But make sure you ask questions. The whole point of, this, of these lectures is to get you guys, all the young students here, to ask questions. right? And you guys ask the best questions. And there are no silly questions. So um, without further ado, we have uh, Sam Gregson, the self-styled Bad boy of physics. <laughs> Thank you, Prem. I appreciate it. Right, so we've got about 38 connected. That is fantastic. Leave that uh, tab open on your phones. We're going to do a little bit of talking first, and then we will be coming back to using that very, very quickly. So, as Prem said, my name is Dr. Sam Gregson. I'm a high energy particle physicist from the University of Cambridge and the Large Hadron Collider. And we've seen that a lot of you know about the Large Hadron Collider. And today, we're going to be talking about fundamental particles, particle physics, and particle physics experiments. So from your high school science, you probably know that the whole universe is made up of atoms. atoms exactly right. Protons and neutrons in a central nucleus with electrons whizzing around the outside. But that raises another question for us particle physicists. What are these made of? Are they made of something smaller underneath? That's the question that a particle physicist seeks to answer by smashing particles together and seeing those little pieces that are underneath. So when we wanted to work out what the fundamental blocks of the universe were, we came up with this experiment, the Large Hadron Collider. It's a 27-kilometer long tunnel under the Franco-Swiss border which smashes protons together at nearly the speed of light. So one coming anti-clockwise, one coming clockwise, and they smash together. Now, before we can start learning about this thing, you're going to turn the damn thing on, right? This is going to be your first job today. It's going to be to power up this amazing experiment. So if we go back to our lovely setup where everyone is connected, you have your first job of the day, if I open this up, is going to be to turn this damn thing on. So, how do you think 
we get high energy particles like protons whizzing around at high speeds. Anyone? You've fallen in the trap. It's the other one. Anyone else? Yes. All right. Anyone else have a guess how we get charged particles whizzing around at nearly the speed of light? Not quite magnets, we use electric fields, right? Magnets are going to come up in a minute, but we use very, very strong electric fields, very, very high voltages, right? Charged particles can be whizzed around using very, very high voltages. This is why we use charged particles like protons. We don't use neutrons, right? Because they're not electrically charged. So, as I promised, first game is going to be to turn on the Large Hadron Collider. Very, very simple game. What do you think you need to do? What do you have on your phone? Excellent. I want you to charge up the high voltage systems. Now, science is all about working together. You are all working together to get this high voltage system on. What is the problem going to be? Right. So, we need to be able to stop. Yes? 1,602 volts is the necessary voltage for this system. Can we get there? Right, we are there now. Excellent, good. Good. Right, how are we going to fix this? Talk. How would we do this in science? How are we going to collaborate? How are we going to work together to fix this problem? Anybody? Hello? Right. Do it! <laughs> you can talk louder than that, I'm sure. You were talking louder before we started. Right, stop! Yes, everyone stop. Good. Right, who's going to take charge? Who's going to take charge? <laughs> stop! 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 Right, this is the whole point. In science, everyone has their own job to do, right? Stop! You had it then. It's so close. Stop! Stop. No one has ever done this, by the way. So you could be the first team to ever achieve this if you can just behave yourselves. But I don't think it's going to be possible, is it? Right, I'll give you 10 more seconds. Stop. If you stop and one person does it, we can achieve this. But I don't think you're going to be able to do it, right? Fine. It's just a tease. Stop. 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 Right, I give up. Close enough, right? It was there for a second, right? Close enough. Close enough, right? So I'm going to count that as the high voltage on because it stopped there for a second, right? So, we'll go, with, we'll go with yes, right? So, high voltage on. Then we want to get, so we've got these particles whizzing around, these charged particles whizzing around at very high speed. Now we want to get them going around, what shape is the LHC? Circle. We want to get them going around in circles. How do we do that? Magnets. Magnets are what make the particles go around in these circular pathways. Here's one of the large blue dipole magnets from the LHC. You might have seen these blue tubes. This is what they look like in, inside. Essentially, huge magnets. Now, does anyone know what we need to do to make these magnets incredibly, incredibly powerful? How do we make the strongest magnets that we need to get these particles moving around? You do? And how do we get enough electricity into them? There's a very special thing that we have to do to them. Anyone know? How can I get so much electricity into them? I'll give you a clue. Anyone want to have a guess? Right. What do we use? Yes. Exactly right. So we make them superconducting by cooling them down. And what we use to do that is liquid helium, right? Liquid helium is a really cool substance, right? Not just like that, but also cool in the, you know, other sense. 
So it never ever becomes a solid. It always remains a liquid, all the way down to as close to absolute zero as we can get. So we can always use it as a coolant to cool down these magnets and make them incredibly powerful. So this is my favorite game that I get you to do, right? You're going to turn on these magnets. So what do you have on your phone? What do you have? Oh. Stop a second. Stop a second. Stop. Right, I'll turn the sound off. It's not that exciting, right? Now, what do you have on your telephone? Numbers. How many numbers do you have? You have 44 numbers on your phone. You have one single number on your phone, right? Somebody has number one, somebody has number two, somebody has number three. Your job is to press these numbers in order. No one ever has made it past 20, ever, okay. ever. And that's all you have to do is press numbers in order, right? It's another game that shows you that science is all about collaboration, working together. You are part of a team. You have a job to do. Where is number one? Stop, please. Right, so whoever you're sat next to, you know that they're messing up. So tell them to stop. Who's number one? Number two. It's not, it's not that funny. Come on. Number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Now the numbers on your phone might change randomly, so be careful. Six, seven. Come on. Oh. Gonna give you one more go, right? I want to see you up past twenty. Yes, it makes funny noises. I know. Stop, please. Let's try and get past twenty. Who's the, who's messing up? Right. Stop. I want to see us past 20. <laughs> okay, that was interesting. Right, so we'll go now, two, three. Just give it a second and wait for your number. It's a game I like to call delayed gratification, yes? Three. I can get it to tell me who number three is. Good. 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 10, good, 11, let's make it to 20. That's the record, 20. I know somebody's gonna pop out at 19, I know it. You're the new record holders. Can we make it to the end? No way, no. Right, 24, new record, right? I'm gonna count that as done, because that is a new record. Congratulations, that was really good. Right, it's a very, very difficult game when you're all working together, right? So, we've got the particles whizzing around at high speeds. We've got them whizzing around in circles, right? The next thing you need to do is get them to smash into one another. Now, we make that easier by having lots of particles, having them going around in a circle so they pass each other a lot of times, and traveling at very, very high speeds, right? So your final game before we get into some actual hardcore physics is going to be to run these particles around. So let me set this up a second here. Uh, and whoop, stop that one second. And we will go back to the, just got to get rid of that one second. So we're gonna play this game. I'm gonna give you a trial run to start with, right? You each have your own proton. On your phone, you have a color and a number. Can you see that? Yes? Right? Find your color and your number and make yourself go along the beam pipe. Yes? So you have control. Harry's already gone. I don't know what he was doing, right? So tech is gone. Ledlin's gone, right? So I want you to go along the beam pipe. This is what we have to do with the protons, right? The magnets have to guide the protons down the beam pipe, right? Without them hitting the walls, 
Obviously, the beam pipe isn't this deviated in real life, but without them hitting the walls, preferably without them hitting others, to hit a, to hit a pile of protons that are coming the other way. Saren still got three lives. Where's Saren? Very good. Right? So, this is a trial run, and then we're going to run it for real, right? Good. Very, very good. It gets harder, it gets faster, and it gets more deviated as we go along. Dominic is the winner. Where's Dominic? Right, well done. Good. Right. So, does everyone understand what they need to do? Yes? So we're going to play one time for real. Get some music on. And let's go. Are we ready? Three, two, one, go. So you've got 10 seconds before we go into the pipe to find your proton. You are essentially controlling the magnets and the LHC, right? It would move all the protons at once, but you're controlling just one. You don't want to hit the edges of the pipe, right? So find your proton. You can move faster by holding it down if you need to. So, Lohan in the lead at the moment. Where's Lohan? Good. Right, nice. Lohan's still in the lead. Jacob's out. Shane's out. Zach's out. Can we get any protons to the end? Gab's out. Joseph's out. Good. Evan in the lead at the moment. Evan G. Where's Evan G? Good. 20 seconds left. Now, if you still have the same number of lives at the end, the winner will be the one who's closest to the top. So just to make you aware, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And our winner is Sinan. Where's Sinan? Well done. Superb, well done. This festive season. Right, and then, and then the adverts come on, right? Good. Good, right, excellent. So we've got these particles whizzing around. We've got them going in circles. We've got them going down these beam pipes to smash into one another. Now we can start looking for stuff in those collisions. One of the things we go looking for is this little Higgs boson. Who's heard of the Higgs boson? A few of you, excellent, right? By the end of this lecture, you should understand what this is why it's important, and that it's in this very room with us today. So, what do you need to know as particle physicists to go looking for this thing? Well, you need to know that everything around us is made up of tiny Lego building blocks called particles. You told me earlier that everything was made up of atoms, but we now know that that's not really the case because atoms are made up of protons and neutrons and electrons, but protons and neutrons are made of even smaller things called quarks. So it actually turns out that the smallest things that we know that make up the solid things around us are quarks and electrons. These are the smallest building blocks. Anyone heard that light is a wave and a particle? Yeah, we've heard of that. So light is also made of particles called photons, right? So solid things, particles, light particles. And something you probably haven't come across yet, but even the forces between particles are also particles. What happens if I put two magnets close together? Or, or they repel. So they attract or they repel. But how does one magnet know if one is plus or one is minus, or one is north or one is south? They don't have a brain. What's actually happening is there's a stream of invisible particles going backwards and forwards all the time between those two magnets, carrying a force, carrying information. And we now know from 50 years of particle physics experiments that there's not that many different types of particles that make up the universe. The universe was quite kind. There's the quarks in that green box, which make up solid things because they make up protons and neutrons. There's the leptons, like the electron, which whiz around inside the atom. And then there's the bosons. And these bosons are the force carriers. They're the things that carry force between different particles. So magnetism, the strong force that keeps things together. Radioactivity in the weak force. 
These are the things that carry force. So using that idea of particles and forces, we can explain everything from the very tiny up to the most awe-inspiring galaxy. But there was one fundamental question that we couldn't answer. Why do some of those building blocks, some of those particles, have no mass and no weight, like a photon? I can't catch a photon, I can't weigh it, it has no mass, it has no weight. Why do some of them have no mass and weight, and yet others definitely do? Where does mass come from? To answer that question, we needed to find this little guy, this little Higgs boson, to help us answer this question. Because without it, our entire understanding of the universe completely falls apart. So today, you're going to be looking for this little guy, this little Higgs boson, right? We played a couple of games to get the LHC on. Now you're going to go looking for it. So, looking for new particles at the LHC is a bit like using social media. Who uses social media? Don't be shy. Come on. Come on. Yes, quite a few of you, right? So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, right? Now, why is it like using social media? Well, first of all, we produce a hell of a lot of rubbish, right? So when we smash particles together, here's what happens. Particles come together, they smash together, they disappear in a ball of energy, and they very quickly reappear as a bunch of new, exotic, interesting particles, right? So let's see that one more time, yeah? So when we smash particles together, they come in, they smash together, their energy is transferred into creating loads of rotten rubbish, right? And what we have to do, yes, some of these slides are a little bit out of date, right? So what we have to do is kind of act like the filter, right? We act like the hashtag, which takes all of these collisions, all of these tweets, all of this information, and filters it down. So on Twitter, you might use a hashtag. On somewhere else, you might use some kind of search term to filter all of that rotten rubbish and only look for the interesting stuff that we want to keep. Now, again, slide's a little bit out of date. How do we go looking for this little Higgs boson that we're interested in? Well, we know that this little Higgs boson likes to hide in particle collisions that produce leptons, electrons and muons in particular. So if we can produce lots of electrons and muons in collisions, then we might be able to find these little Higgs bosons. So here's a, an example of the kind of thing that's going on. The particles come in, they smash together, they produce all of this yellow rotten rubbish, and every now and again, they produce these beautiful lepton tracks, green or red, that show you that one of these little Higgs bosons might be hiding inside. So, I'm going to split you into two teams. You're going to do a little bit of a competition. Yes? First of all, Team Atlas. So anyone to the right of the middle, roughly there, you can decide which side you want to be on. Everyone to the right of this line is going to be on Team Atlas. Give me a cheer, Team Atlas. Come on, we can do a lot better than that. I know, I know we're teenagers. Team Atlas, give me a cheer. Yeah. Good, that's what I like to see, good. Come in late, but bring the energy, that's it, right? And on the left, you are on Team CMS. Give me a cheer, Team CMS. Yeah. Come on, we can do better one more time. Yeah. Good, right. So, Atlas and CMS were the two experiments at the Large Hadron Collider that were looking for this little particle, this little Higgs boson, which we thought might help us with this problem with mass. Here is a picture of the Atlas experiment, right? It's a huge cylinder of steel and electronics. There's a chap at the bottom here for scale, yeah? Six foot tall guy. He's over 10 meters wide, weighs over 100 tons of steel and electronics, right? Particles come in to the plane of the board, out of the board, smash together. All of that rotten rubbish we saw hits the sides of the detector. And the detector essentially takes pictures of all of that rubbish that comes out to decide what's in it and see if anything new is in there that we haven't 
seen before, right? Here's an example of one of the pictures that they make. So again, we see a collision in the center. All of this rotten yellow rubbish that we've seen before comes out. And now and again, these beautiful green and red tracks that tell us maybe one of those little Higgs bosons is hiding, was produced in this particle collision. So I'm going to need some volunteers. Yes, this is always fun. Yes, won't make you do anything horrible. To come up to the front and help me collect the data that you will need to discover the Higgs boson. I'm going to need about five, six volunteers at least from each team. Come on, otherwise I will just make you do it. It's not horrible, I promise. If you want to come up, come up. CMS on this side, Atlas on this side. Don't be shy. I need like six to ten from each team. It is not horrible. It's very, very easy. Don't be shy. Otherwise, I will just make you do it. Right? Uh, come and stand on this side if you're on Atlas. Right? Don't be shy. Everyone is welcome. A few more on this team, please. Otherwise, I'm just going to make you. Right, you four, up, go, go, good, there we go, couple on the end, up, up, both of you, up, 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 good, right, here's what we're going to do, right, and you can also, if you want, play in the audience, if you go to this website, www.ministryofsense.com, you can also play in the audience, you can pick your team, Atlas or CMS, all of your clicks from the audience, if you were uncomfortable coming up, can go towards the game as well, right? So you go to that website. Here's what we're going to do, right? Everyone watching the front, I'm going to show you some particle collisions from the Large Hadron Collider, some real particle collisions. And all I want you to do is keep anything that contains two or more green tracks. The first one, yes or no? Yeah? First one, easy. Yes or no? Second one, yes or no? Yes. Third one, yes or no? No. Very, very simple, right? Very, very simple, right? Right? <laughs> right. Now, here we go. We're going to do it for real, yeah? I click. What happens is they start popping out. All you have to do is any time you see the combination of particles I tell you to do, you come to the front, you push the bottom left of the trackpad, you go to the back of your group, and that's it. Make sense? You've got one minute to collect as many as possible. So, let's see what you're going to be collecting. Anytime it has a red in it, keep it simple. Anytime, any red, you see red? You click the bottom left of the pad, you go to the back. Make sense? Right. You must be wearing the hat when you click the thing. Yes? If you don't go fast enough, as defined by myself and only myself, you get some of this. Yes? Right. Are we ready? Come to the front. Look for the U. Look for a U or any red. Bottom left of the pad. Are we ready, sir? Yes. You can click the bottom left and go. Anytime you see red, click. Good. To the back. Stop cheating. To the back. Come on. Give him the hat. Give him the hat. <coughs> Go, any red, any red, good, back, well done, good, that's what I want to see, any red, you can do this in the audience as well, remember, any red, any red, wait, wait, red, okay, go get cheeky, why did you get some of this, right, red, 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 good, well done, excellent, next, well done, good, excellent, go, in about one minute. So this is like one collision per second, right? At the LHC, 40 million particle, well done, 40 million particle collisions every single second. And the computer has to decide yes or no. That's a miss. That's a bad miss. Right. Red, red, right. Good. And next, there's probably about 10 seconds left. Red, wait. Good. Well done. Red, hat's not on. Hat not on. <laughs> Next, left, good, stop. Give them a round of applause, please. Good, well done. Right. So, 
You, can, you guys can sit down. Well done. That was really good. Right. So they clicked 16 times. Every time they clicked was correct. So very well done. Right? They were very discerning. But they missed 24 that they could have got, right? With their bad attitudes, yes? And not being quick enough. That was very good, though. Excellent. 40% efficiency, right? So remember, at the LHC, that was one collision a second. It's already difficult. At the LHC, 40 million or more now collisions every single second. And the computer has to decide, keep, throw, keep, throw, keep, throw, depending on whether it keeps or contains anything interesting. Right? So 40%, not bad. Right, you guys. Up you come. Hats. Good. Yours is a little bit more difficult because you've already seen what's happening. Two or more reds. Make sense? You see two reds, you click. There can be a load of other rubbish in there, but it has to have at least two reds. Are we ready, sir? Yeah. Three, two, one, and go. Two reds, we click. Good. Very good start. Right, off we go. Wait, wait, wait. Good, go. Mess it up so I can spray this gun at you. Good. <laughs> Good. This is very leaky. Oh! Right, go. He, to be fair, he did, he did quite well against that. I'll get him later. Right. Good. Well done. Keep going. Pass the hat. Don't smash my computer, please. Good. Two or more reds. Well done. And next. Good. Good, well done, that was a hard one. Good, probably about 20 seconds left. Two reds, two reds, well done. And next, two reds. Well done, excellent. Well done, and again, two reds. Good, two reds. Excellent, doing really, really well. Probably about 10 seconds left, if that. Good, well done, stop. Very, very good. Give them a big round of applause. Well done. You guys, you guys can sit down. Well done. Well done. Really, really good. You can sit down. So, in this case, they clicked 19 and got 18. So they got slightly more, but they got one wrong, right? Which gives them an efficiency of 37 and a half. At the end, I will show you who won out of those two, right? So... Very, very close, though. I can already see that the results are very, very close. Right? But before... So all of that data that you just clicked has been saved in that computer, right? And at the end, I will show you who did the best. But before I can do that, I need to show you how to analyze that data. And I need to introduce you to a way of thinking that's very important for us particle physicists. It's what I like to call the beauty of the scientific method. Yes? So anyone know who that is? Einstein, yes, yes. This is what I was trying to aim towards as an undergrad and never quite got there, right? <laughs> so, all of your data has been saved in the computer. Now, why is the scientific method such a beautiful thing? Because using that silly little game at the front, but on real LHC data as we, can, as we did, and using that scientific method, we can prove today that that little Higgs boson, a new particle that a lot of you had never heard of, exists in this room with us today. So, first step of the scientific method, who knows what it is? There are no wrong answers. I mean, there are a lot of wrong answers, but I won't be mean about them. Yes. Sort of. What's, what's, our, what's our friend got going on? Yeah. Hypothesis, Hypothesis making. Excellent, right? So, we have a problem, and we think of sensible solutions as to how we might solve that problem. These sensible solutions are known as hypotheses, right? And just like a criminal trial, in a criminal trial, we say a defendant is innocent until proven guilty, right? A hypothesis, we don't assume it's correct until we can prove it with enough reason, enough evidence. So, we remember earlier... I said that I have a hypothesis that there's a new particle in this room with us today that tells us why other particles get their mass. 
First question. What should your first question be? Yeah, why? Prove it, right? Now, first of all, who thinks it's not that important to understand where mass comes from? Who's not that bothered? Good, there's always one, right? I'm going to show you why it's very important to understand where mass comes from. <laughs> Plastic bottle. Lots of mass or a little bit of mass? A little bit? Yeah, okay, good. All right. Fine, 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 fine. Fine, 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 fine. What about these? A little bit of mass or a lot of mass? A little bit of mass? Yeah, okay, fine. All right. What about this? A <laughs> little bit of mass or a lot of mass? A lot of mass, right? So it's very important to understand where mass comes from, right? Or I can get myself in trouble very, very quickly, right? It's very, very important. I usually do this with peas, but they all went rotten in the bag, so it was no good, right? Now, understanding where mass comes from is even more important in particle physics, right? Remember this beautiful little Lego build building block set of the universe I showed you? Looks really, really beautiful, colorful, simple. Give that to your little brother, little sister for Christmas. They can start creating the universe, yeah? Here's the maths that explains how those blocks go together, yeah? It's called the standard model. So imagine, yeah, imagine you get this for Christmas in your IKEA instructions. This comes, yes? how to put it together. There's page number two, yes? Not very simple. Now, I don't expect you to understand that. Very difficult equation. But I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, all of human knowledge of huge ideas about physics is contained in these red boxes. So this red box contains all our understanding of anything to do with nuclear stuff, radiation. I say nuclear, you say? Radiation, radiation something else, nuclear? Radiation. Okay, good. <laughs> you got, as you start, give him a whack. Yes? <laughs> nuclear power, nuclear? Waste. Yeah, nuclear waste, nuclear medicine. Still, Any, st still radiation, yeah? Good, <laughs> right? Anything to do with nuclear stuff, the entirety of human understanding is in that six lines of maths, yeah? Anything to do with structure is in this box of maths. So this explains why protons and neutrons bind together and why we don't just fall apart in a sludge on the floor. It explains stars, it explains planets. So without these red boxes, there'd be huge areas of science that we don't understand. And notice how many times this letter M appears. What do we think M stands for, not radiation? Mass. mass, right? So understanding where mass comes from is very, very important because if any of these M's are zero, huge pieces of this equation disappear. And we don't understand the universe around us. So it's very, very important to understand where mass comes from. And we didn't know until three brilliant theoretical physicists, Peter Higgs, Francois Anglais, and Robert Brout, came up with a hypothesis. They said that there's an invisible field known as the Higgs field, which is everywhere in the universe, right? It's in this room with us right now. But we can't see it, we can't touch it, we can't taste it, right? And it acts kind of like a treacle. When particles go through it, they feel a drag. Who's seen Star Wars? Good. What is there in Star Wars that's everywhere in the universe at the same time? They assure us it's there, but you can't see it, you can't touch it, and you can't taste it. Yes. Force. Right. So this is kind of like the force from Star Wars, right? I'm telling you that there's a force field that you can't feel that's everywhere in the universe at the same time, right? And I'm suggesting that it's that that gives things their mass. Now, I'm going to need four volunteers to come down to the front and help me show 
My hypothesis of how particles get their mass, yeah, you really want to come, don't you? You can see, you're one. Get down here. Good. Right, I need three more. Come on. Good. Good, that's it. The last one wasn't too terrible, was it? Right, one more. Excellent, well done. Give him a round of applause, come on. Good. Right. First question is for the audience. I need the two out of these four that are the most energetic. Shay, good. Right, excellent. I need the second most energetic. Harry. Harry, good. Right. <laughs> Harry. <laughs> Shay. <laughs> Other way around, it's the cool way, right? So, our first two friends are photons. They are particles of light. They don't interact with the Higgs field, these bands, at all. So they can whiz around anywhere they want to go in this room with one rule. Are we listening to the one rule? We always have to be moving at the speed of light. Oh. Go! Go! Good. So they appear to have no mass because they don't interact with the Higgs field at all. Right? They move around at the speed of light. Our second friend, whose name is... Ismail is a particle with a little bit of mass, like an electron. So he interacts a little bit with the Higgs field. Run! That way, Ismail. Oh. That way. Run! Run! As hard as you can. Come on, you can do more than that. He interacts a little bit with the Higgs field. So he appears to have a little bit of mass. And our final friend, over here you come, whose name is... Jake. Oh. <laughs> Jake interacts quite strongly with the Higgs field. Under the arms, please. Good. So he appears to interact very strongly. He appears to have quite a lot of mass. Run, then. Good. Come on, Jake. Work it. Come on. Come on. Come on, Jake. Come on. Right. So this is why different particles appear to have different amounts of mass, because they interact by different amounts with the Higgs field. Jake, you can stop. Well done. Good. Sit down, please. Give them a big round of applause. Good, well done. <laughs> Good job, well done. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Cheers. <laughs> Good. Right. So that's my hypothesis. That's how different particles get their different amounts of mass. Photons don't interact with the Higgs field much. They can whiz around at the speed of light, no mass. Particles like electrons interact a little bit, so they appear to have a little bit of mass. And particles with a lot of mass, that's because they interact a lot with the Higgs field. What's your comment on that hypothesis? Anyone? Good, you're happy. Makes sense, doesn't it? What should we ask as scientists? You're all happy that to tell, things, to tell you that things have mass, I have to tell you that the force from Star Wars exists. We're all happy with that. And why can I prove it is the question. Yes, that is the question you should ask. Fortunately, you've already proven it, right? Because if we smash particles together with a lot of energy, this Higgs field that's in the background starts to ripple. And those little ripples pop out as these little Higgs bosons. So when you were playing the earlier game, Every time you clicked and you got a nice big green tick, you were showing that one of these ripples in the Higgs field was being produced, these little Higgs bosons. So finding these little Higgs bosons tells us that this force field exists in the background and that it's that force field that gives things their mass and their weight. So the force from Star Wars does kind of exist. Now, my favorite part of this show it's called data analysis. Why can we not just say that's the end? Why can we not just look at our data, say we saw some Higgs bosons, that's the end of it? Why do we need to analyze data? Anyone? Yeah, identify trends. I like to say because human beings are stupid. Yes? One thing we do is we're incredibly biased. Here's a simple question for you. How would you rate your physical fitness? Yes? Have a think, talk amongst yourselves. 
for 10, 15 seconds how you would answer this question. Okay, okay. Now, if I ask a group of people this question, I need to go back to the slides. What's happened here? It's not going back to the slides. Oh, I need to turn the slide off. My fault. If I ask a group of people this question, here is the honest answer that I would expect to see. Right? It's called a Gaussian or a normal distribution. Most people are average, they're in the middle. Some people are Olympic level athletes, and some people are not, right? Now, I've been to Swansea doing this show a lot of times. And over that time, I've asked 100 people who live in Swansea, just normal people on the street, because I'm fun like this, this very question. Do you think they gave me the answer that I would expect to see? Let's take a look. Now, is everyone in Swansea an Olympic level super athlete? No, right? So the point here is human beings are extremely biased, right? This is the overconfidence cognitive bias, right? We want to think that we're really good at stuff, even if we're not, right? It's not a bad thing to be confident in your abilities, right? But there are lots of these biases that we suffer from that help us get to answers quickly, but not necessarily correctly. And we need to consider them in science. If you go to the world's most important scientific research portal, which is, good, Wikipedia, you're well on the way to being particle physicists, yes? And you type in cognitive bias, here's what you get. 10 or 15 different ways of thinking that make humans get to the right answer, sorry, to get to an answer quickly, but not necessarily the right answer. We're already at BI, and we've already got 10 or 15, right? There are over 200 ways of thinking that humans have that get them to answers quickly, but not necessarily accurately. I'm gonna introduce you to two of them, which are some of the worst ways of thinking that we have. I'm gonna start by showing you a graph. Total number of US highway deaths. Some data over time. Lovely downward trend with time, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000. The deaths are going down. Anyone want to tell me why? What's on the X axis? Anyone want to have a guess? Say again. Yeah? What could, be the, what could be the other variable here? Why are there less deaths? Yeah. Right, more cars, but we might expect the deaths to go up with more cars, right? Yeah? Right, so improving safety, maybe the cars are getting safer. Anyone else want to have a guess? Yeah. Yeah, maybe better highways, safer roads. Any, anyone else? Yeah? Yeah, more roads, so there's less you know, safer roads and more roads for people to go on? No. This is the number of US highway deaths against the number of fresh lemons imported to the USA from Mexico. Well, <laughs> anyone think that we should make cars like this? That's the, uh, that's the new Citroen. Yeah, it's a bad joke. Right, now, the question is, as our friend was saying, why have I shown you a graph if it means absolutely nothing? Anyone want to have a stab at that? Because it, it, it looks a bit, it doesn't look that impressive, does it? It's like a horrible Excel graph. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. It proves one of these cognitive biases, right? Just because two things look related, it doesn't mean that one makes the other happen, right? We say correlation is not causation. 
Just because two things follow a pattern, it doesn't mean that one makes the other happen. It just so happens that as the deaths go down, for all the reasons that you said, people also start eating less lemons for some reason, right? Maybe they make artificial lemon flavor or whatever it is. Here's another one. The number of people who drowned by falling in a pool each year. What causes that to happen? Have we learned anything? It is indeed. Well done. It's the number of films that Nicolas Cage was in that year, right? So, these are getting a bit older. I should probably... Who's a terrible actor nowadays? I should update the slides, right? But who thinks that Nicolas Cage's films make people want to kill themselves? <laughs> Maybe, right? But we can't just look at the graph and follow the pattern. We'd actually have to stand outside the cinema and say, you know, you've just seen Snake Eyes or whatever. How, how's your mental health now, yes? We can't just look at the pattern and assume the causation. Here's one more with a prize on offer, yes? There's a significant prize for this. But you have to be loud and you have to be quick. Yes? Can we do that? This is going to be one of the last things today. Spell ilk. Nice and loud. Nice and loud. Come on, everyone. One more time. Spell silk. One more time. One final time. What do cows drink? Good. <laughs> Good. There has to be one. If there's not one, it doesn't work. Right? So most people saw what was going on. Our friend over here said milk. Do you want to tell us why you said milk? Don't be... So it's fine. They produce milk. They drink water. They drink water, right? Sorry? That's the way to get out of it, but didn't go for that one, unfortunately. Right, baby cows drink milk. But usually cows drink water, right? This is the worst way of thinking that humans have. It's called confirmation bias or expectation bias. You build up an expectation of what's coming, ilk, silk, you pay it off by saying milk, right? Saying ilk, silk, water, how does that feel? Just feels wrong. Yeah, unnatural. Your brain is telling you you missed the pattern. Something is wrong, right? But the point here is in science, the answer might be ilk, silk, water, right? And just because your brain doesn't like it, that's tough, right? So there's a couple of biases I wanted to introduce you to. Now we can see who won our little game, who did best, right? So... I need this one. So here is the data from earlier when you were playing that little clicking game at the front and in the audience, right? Every time you click, a little point is added to these boxes. The masses of all the particles in the collision are added together. The way we look for a new particle is we try to find peaks in this distribution. Anyone think that they can see a peak in either of these distributions? Yeah? Looks like there might be a little bit in the middle. But remember our confirmation biases, yeah? If I tell you to see a peak, you always will see a peak. We can see peaks all over these distributions. So we let the computer look for the biggest one. First, it finds the background, all the times you clicked wrong. And then it goes looking for the biggest peak in the data. And it says that it's found a peak in both of them. So well done. You played the game well. Atlas, your score is 0.0000009, right? What does that mean? It means that that's the chance that there is no peak, that this is just noise without a peak. So if you flip it over, 99.999991 that you found a new particle. So that's very, very good, right? To win Team CMS, it's on this side, you need a score lower than that. Do you think you did it? No, not confident. Let's take a look. So our winners today, just our Team CMS. Give yourselves a big round of applause.
Now, what we can do is combine both of your sets of data. And we can see today if working together as a group of schools, you had enough right clicks in the audience and at the front to discover this new Higgs boson particle in this room today. So I've combined the data, or the computer has. You have to reach what we call the five sigma standard. Again, do we think we made it working together? <laughs> Mixed bag of answers. Let's have a look with appropriate musical accompaniment. Just. So by combining both of your sets of data, neither of you had enough clicks to find this new particle today. But when we combine them, we can say that using both of your sets of data, you discovered this new particle in this room with us today. So give yourselves a huge round of applause. Right. Final. Final demonstration today. So, so, because you have listened to me for nearly an hour, you now get to throw things at me. Yes? yes? So, I've got some protons. Our friend's already got some. Open them, try and not break the zip if you can, please. Right? Hand these protons out. You are going to get to throw them at me because we're going to make some particle collisions for real to finish. Hand them out as quickly as you can. How are we getting on? Everyone got a couple of balls? Good. Right. As promised, you're now going to get to throw them at me, yes? Now, here's what I need. I want as many particle collisions in the heart of this detector, yes, as we can get. Understood? So three rules. As many collisions in the detector as we can get. Rule number two. How many do you want? <laughs> right, rule number two. You can throw them as many times as you want. You can pick them up, re-throw them, just like we do at the LHC. They go round and round, right? Please try and stay roughly in your seat. So I, I'm going to go up this side, back down, up the other side, and back down. Yes, yeah? so you get plenty of time to throw things at me, right? Rule number three is the most important rule. As few collisions in the middle of my face <laughs> as possible. Yes? Nobody listens to rule number three. Right? Who's going to give me a count from five? Five. Four, three, two, one, go. <laughs> Come on! Not bad. As many in the bin as we can get. Come on, let's go. Nice, not bad, not bad, not bad. Keep going. Ow! That was definitely not in the bin. Ow! Ow! 
Ow! Good. Good. Ow! Ow! Come on then! Ow! 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 Right, as many. Good. Many in the bin as we can get. Good. Good. Come on. We got a little more. Come on. Good. Right, good. Right, that's enough. Good. <laughs> that is that is absolutely woeful. Right. But I know that wasn't the point. Right. All right, good. Thank you. Right. We're going to make a particle explosion for real, right? Now, to ensure that you don't die, what I need is everyone on the front row to pick up as many balls as they can find and just dump them into the bin for me, nice and quickly. Yeah, only take a second. Just as many balls as you can find and just dump them in the bin. Huh? Some advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, very much. <laughs> Good. <laughs> right, good. As many as we can get in the bin. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I got you good for that. <laughs> Yeah, that'll work. Right, that'll work. Good, thank you. Right. So. <laughs> Teacher, teachers worse than the rest of them. Right. So. If you want to sit at the front, you can sit at the front. It is safe. But you... It is louder than you imagine it's going to be. If you don't like loud noises, you're okay? Yeah. Right, fine. Right. Now, I've got some very simple things. I've got a simple lemonade bottle, right? Just a normal lemonade bottle, two litre lemonade bottle. I've got some water from the tap. Cold water from the tap. And I've got something that's a little bit more interesting. Some dry ice, right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take about 200 grams of the dry ice and I'm going to put it into this lemonade bottle. Now, anyone want to tell me what dry ice is. Well done. It is indeed frozen carbon dioxide. So usually we think of carbon dioxide as a gas that's in the air around us. People are getting very concerned with the levels of carbon dioxide for climate change, global warming. But here it's solid, like it is on, on Mars, for example. All right? Anyone want to have a guess, or does anyone know at what temperature carbon dioxide becomes a solid like this. Anyone want to have a guess? Minus 196 would have my hand in the bottle. Minus 29 something doesn't exist. Anyone else want to have a guess? It's definitely minus. A bit higher than that, but we're getting in, we're in the right ballpark. So about minus 70. Minus 80, right? So I'm going to take about 200 grams of this and just siphon it into the bottle. If I grip it, it will burn. But if I just kind of coax it on my hands, it's not too bad. Right? So we're going to take about 200 grams of this and just cover the bottom of the bottle with dry ice. That's about right. Yeah? 
and put that to one side. I'm now going to take 500 mils of water from the cold tap. What's the temperature of water from the cold tap? Maybe in Wales it's zero, I don't know. Yeah, 15, 20, depending on the season, right? Maybe 10, depending on the season, right? I'm going to put it into here. What's going to happen to the carbon dioxide? It's going to expand, right? It's going to turn from a solid into a gas. What takes up more space, a gas or a solid? A gas, not a solid, gas. What happens if I don't allow it to take up any more space by putting the lid on very, very tight? Right, it's going to go bang, right? So, this, as I have promised, will be extremely, extremely loud. If you don't like that, go to the back, leave, or forever hold your peace, yes? So, if you want to record it, you can. It works very nicely on slow-mo. So if you record on slow-mo, you can always speed it up later if you need to, right? So, 500 mils of cold water. If you could be nice and quiet, because it's very, very dangerous. Not for you, but for me, yes? Once I've got away, if you're quiet, you can hear what's actually going on with the bottle. So, everyone okay? Okay at the front? Good. So that's an idea of just how energetic particle collisions can be, right? That is the end of the presentation. There is one final question. Would you like me to do one more? Yes. <laughs> do we have time to do one more? Yes. <laughs> I don't think that's a decision you can make, but... Prem, uh, Sarah, do we have time for one more? Yeah, two, minutes. two minutes, right. So if we have two minutes, what I need is anyone who wants to see another one to grab as many balls as they can and dump them in the bin. Nice and carefully because the floor is now really wet. Yeah, it's, it's really loud. This is the bowl for anyone who wants to see. Good, thank you very much. Perfect, right. Just gonna need to get a bit more water. Can you please fill them up and on your way out, please uh, place them there at the table. And uh, at, the, at the end of Sam's presentation, basically we break for lunch. Uh, so all students, you have, you're on your own basically. You can wander around campus and get food from any one of the food joints on campus. Uh, the teachers, you can come over to the Vivian Tower, the physics department. Um, and then we all meet here exactly at 1 o'clock, a little bit before 1 o'clock, for the second set of lectures. Okay.
Thank you. Right, so same deal. If you want to take pictures, get your phone set up on slow-mo. Do that now. Right. So, 200 grams or so dry ice. Off to one side. About 500 mils of cold water. That was, a, that was a good one. Woo. Everyone okay? Good. So that's the end of today's presentation. Thank you for being so amazing, being so engaged, being so interactive. I hope you enjoyed it. The serious message is just how important that scientific method, scientific thinking can be. You used it today in a simplified way to find a new particle, right? But we also thought about other things like road safety and uh, Nicolas Cage films, yes? Working out how they affect people. Lots of different ways we can use this scientific method. So I encourage you, when you come to choosing options, to at least consider, you don't have to, taking a scientific subject. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.